We move to continuous variables, and that is Moran's I, which is probably the, the most um, commonly used statistic. And let's just start by taking a look at it. And this statistic, the numerator part, should be very familiar. Ignore the rest for now and just focus on this. We have our familiar double sum, sum over I, sum over J. We have our spatial weights, W, I, J, and we have our cross product, Z, I, and Z, J. Now, to get around this problem, remember I said the gamma statistic is scale dependent. And if we multiply big numbers together, we get really big numbers. To get rid of that, we rescale the variable and we center it on its mean. So these Z's are the deviations from the mean of the original variable. So say the original variable is x of i, then z of i is x of i less the mean of x. So the, the numerator is the weighted cross product of these deviations from the mean. And that is divided by a number. And this number as zero, we just saw it, is the sum of all the weights. And the intuition for this, and we'll get back to that in a second, is this isn't actually a weighted sum of all the pairs. This is only a weighted sum of those pairs for who wij is not zero. Because if it's zero, we don't count them. Okay, keep that in mind. So then the numerator is like a variance. It's a rescaling. It's something, so in the denominator, well, it, the, this is the denominator. In the numerator, we have the product. In the denominator, we have the square differences from the mean, summed up and divided by the number of observations. So this is not an unbiased estimate of the variance, but it's a consistent estimate of the variance. Unbiased estimate would divide it by n minus 1. Okay. Why? Because you're already using up a degree of freedom in computing this, this mean. But we don't worry about this. In fact, all this stuff is going to be asymptotic anyway, so the, we don't worry about it. So then this, since we add up all of these squared differences, there's no weights here. This gets divided by n. So the, the, the scaling factors that we use are related to how many of these elements we actually take into account. So in the numerator, we take into account how many of these wij's are non-zero. The sum of all the weights is in fact this s0. And here, we take into account how many of these we square, which is the number of observations. This will give numbers similar to a correlation coefficient but it is not a correlation coefficient in the standard sense in that when you, with a standard correlation coefficient, if one variable has, say, 0.5 and another one has 0.6, you know that 0.6 is stronger than 0.5. With spatial autocorrelation, you do not. And it may seem counterintuitive, but 0.3 can be more spatially autocorrelated than 0.5 because it all depends on the weights. The value that you get in here is a function of the weights. <clears throat> so we'll continue this. Let's take a short break, and then we'll dig a little further in Moran's eye and its um, visualization. So what we'll do now is figure out, first of all, what exactly is going on here in the numerator and the denominator, and then also go through the inference. And I'll take a little time to present the concepts here because it's a, a cause of a lot of confusion uh, because the same terms are used in like with different meanings and for example randomization versus permutation and so on and I'll uh, set the stage for that. As we saw before uh, the break, the um, scaling factor for the denominator is to get a kind of a variance-like measure. So First, we center things around the mean, and then we take the spread out, so to speak, by dividing by the variance. Um, in the numerator, we divide by the sum of all the uh, weights. So just the sum um, 
of all the W's. Now these, uh, think about this for a second. Um, when you use row standardized weights, so we talked, of, I think you did this in the lab, right? When you row standardize the weights, then the weights for each, no? You did the lab. We were talking about standardizing. Yeah. Yeah. So row standardizing the weights is you start with zero one weights, and then you divide them by how many neighbors there are. So if you have four neighbors, you'll get a bunch of zeros and four ones. Then each of the ones gets divided by four, so you get 0.25. Right? Now the sum of those row standardized weights is how much? By construction, it's one. Right? So the sum of all the weights for all the observations, n. No, for all each each observation has one. Right. So if you sum. The sum for any i, the sum over j is 1. Right? So you sum this over all the i's, there's n i's, so the sum is n. Okay. So for a row standardized weight, the sum of all the weights, the double sum, double, sum i, sum j, w i j, equals n. So then the scaling factor in the numerator and the denominator are the same and they cancel out. For row standardized weights only. Now, if you have islands, we talked about islands, right? Then this is no longer the case. Because the row sum for the island is zero. So if you have islands, then even if you have row standardized weights, the sum of all these weights will not be n, but it will be n minus however many islands you have. So then, they no longer cancel out. This is something to keep in mind when you write software, for example. So uh, that's something in most, in Geoda, it's always row standardized. And cross my fingers, it always does it right. Uh, it's been around for a while now, so I think it would have been, somebody would have caught it, but I think it's, it's fine. Okay. Inference. This is where it gets confusing. We have basically two approaches. And let's take the second one first. The computational approach, we saw this, it's always the same thing. It's permutation. So shuffle around, recalculate, get reference distribution. We're done. The analytical approaches are where we don't do that, but we use some kind of formulas that we work out based on a null, the distribution under the null. And here we have, it's like a tree. We have two ways of going at this. One is to get the exact distribution. Now, the exact distribution, what that means is that you can work out in some kind of a formula what the mean is and what the variance is, and then what the distribution is of that statistic. Now, the mean and the variance alone is not enough. Those are only, as we've seen before, moments or characteristics of the distribution. To fully characterize a distribution, you need all the moments. Now, certain distributions, like the normal, you only need the first two moments, and then you have fully characterized the distribution. So this exact result only works by making a lot of assumptions, like normality and all this kind of stuff. And then it's, it's actually a fairly straightforward exercise. I used to get this um, in my econometrics grad course as homework. Uh, I had Bill Green as my professor. And if you know Green, the Green textbook, there's some exercises in there that uh, are like this. So it's not hard to do. Well, it is, but it's, it's mostly a pain. That, that's, it's, it's not intellectually hard. It's tedious. Um, so that's the exact, exact result. And then there's other analytical results that are approximate. And it's very confusing here, because the exact result you get by assuming normality. The approximate result, you also assume normality. 
But the difference is that you assume normality to get the moments, to get the mean and the variance. And then you throw your hands up in the air and you say, I don't really know what this distribution is, but it's approximately normal. And then I act as if it is normal for the second step. So there's two steps. The first step is to assume that your x, your variable, is normally distributed. And then you compute, and it's kind of tedious, what the mean is. Mean is not tedious, but variance is tedious. And then you say, OK, with these two things, I'm now going to assume that the distribution of my statistic under the null is normal. The second approach assumes a little less. It doesn't assume normality, but it, it assumes equal probability. We've, we've talked about this. This is this randomization case. So under equal probability, we can again, very tedious, derive what the mean is. The mean is easy. The variance is the hard one. And with these two pieces in hand, then we again say, we'll approximate this by a normal distribution. So that is the literature in a nutshell. Okay, now we'll see the specifics. The exact inference is this Tiefeldorf Boots paper. And you assume normality, and then basically what you need is what is the distribution of this thing? This is Moran's I in matrix notation. Y prime W Y over Y prime Y. Y prime Y is the sum of squares. Of course, these are all in deviations from the mean. And this is the sum of the cross products weighted by the elements of W. So using mathematical you know, probability theory, you can derive the distribution of this ratio. It's not the usual case. Um, in the usual case, I don't know how much statistics you've had, but if this matrix is what we call idempotent, it means if you multiply it by itself, you get the same thing. Then this turns into an F distribution. But it isn't. So then it's not an F distribution. But you can still figure out what the distribution is. However, the distribution is kind of like Durbin-Watson. I don't. Those of you who've taken econometrics might recognize a Durbin-Watson statistic. Durbin-Watson is sometimes written as y, y prime A Y over Y prime Y where A is this 0, 1 thing where you lag everything one period. The structure is the same. Durbin-Watson, again, is a tricky one to find a distribution for, so you get these bounds. But you can find the exact distribution for the Durbin-Watson statistic, and that turns out to be a function of the variables. Here it's more. It's a function of the variables and a function of the weights matrix through the eigenvalues of the weights matrix. So I'll spare you the, de the details. I just want you to know this, this result exists. It's there. Okay. It's not used a lot because for two reasons. One, it's very tricky to compute because you have to actually compute the eigenvalues of this weights matrix. And for large data sets, that becomes impractical. And also, for large data sets, it makes less sense to have an exact result because for large data sets, the approximation becomes better and better to the point that you know, the trade-off is you know, for small data sets, you get an exact result here. The normal is only an approximate distribution. But as your sample gets larger, the difference between these two disappears. And the approximation is much easier to compute, so then you don't actually need this. But it's an interesting theoretical result and a great exercise to assign as homework. <laughs> In the analytical inference, as we said, we have the two approaches. One is called normal, which again assumes an uncorrelated normal distribution for the variable. The other one is randomization, and this is that each observation is equally likely to fall on each location. And then what we use is what we call a z-value, which is taking the original statistic, i, centering it, subtracting the mean, 
the mean that we compute using one of these two assumptions and the square root of the variance, which again we compute using one of these two assumptions. So the mechanics are you assume something either normal, uncorrelated, or equal probability, then given those characteristics of the random variable, you compute what is the mean under the null of the Moran's i, this double sum of wij xi zi times cj divided by the variance, and you compute what the variance might be. And then with those in hand, you plug them, you make a z variant, and you plug that in a standard normal table to find out the p-value, approximate p-value. Okay. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. The, um, just to give you a sense of what's going on here. The mean is very easy. The mean turns out to be minus 1 over n minus 1. So this is not 0. The mean under the null hypothesis of no spatial autocorrelation of spatial randomness of Moran's eye is not centered at 0. But it's a little to the negative of 0. These distributions are very weird. If you like to do simulations, you should play around with this sometime. You, they're actually not symmetric. Uh, but as <coughs> n grows, this becomes larger and larger. So for all practical purposes, it becomes zero. So in large data sets, you know this one. You can play with some numbers yourself. If you have 30 observations, or 50, or 100, you could still tell. But if you have 30,000, you know you can't tell. It's zero for all practical purposes. The other thing is that this mean doesn't depend on your random variable. So whether you do spatial autocorrelation for crimes or GDP or you know, soil productivity, doesn't matter. The mean under the null of spatial randomness is only a function of how many observations you have. Under normality, the variance doesn't depend on the variable either. It only depends on the weights matrix. Through these three summary characteristics of the weights matrix, we've already seen S0 as a sum of the weights. S1 is this expression here. And S2 is this other expression, which is just another way of um, summarizing the structure of the weights in the matrix. So the second moment this complicated thing here, there is nothing in there that pertains to the random variable. So again, the variance is the same whether these are crimes or GDP or productivity or telephone calls, doesn't matter. It only depends on the weights matrix. So with these things in hand then, we take our Moran's eye, we subtract the mean, divide by the square root of the variance, Take a z-value, plug it in the standard normal table. That's how we do it. And the randomization, same mean. So the mean is not affected by our assumption. But the variance is another story. So again, we have this very complicated thing with the observations. These s's are in here. But then b2 is in there. And b2 is a ratio of the fourth moment over the square of the second moment. So for the randomization assumption, so remember what we're doing is we're assuming that the values are randomly allocated with equal probability. And then using that, we start cranking. And it's very tedious. Derive what the mean is. Then derive what the second moment is. Then the variance, of course, follows from those two. And uh, here we find that this does depend on the variance. So this is more along the lines of what we're used to. I mean, what we're used to is that a statistic under the null should somehow have something to do with the variable that we're looking at. Under the normal assumption, it does not. It's only related to the weight structure that we are using. With the randomization, it's related to both the variable and the weight structure. So then, um, in the 
computational approach, we've already seen this before, we get this through the significance and then we um, can play games like this where we start with Columbus, this is the real data, we reshuffle them, we get a Moran's eye like this, we do this many, many times, um, and then we end up with uh, this kind of reference distribution. This is a screenshot of Geoda, where this is the empirical distribution of Moran's eye, this yellow bar is the one we actually observe, up here it tells you we did 999 permutations. None of the permuted values is larger than or equal to the one we observe. So we have 0 0.001, which is it. And then below here we have um, the theoretical value. So this is our observed Moran's eye. This is minus 1 over n minus 1. This is the mean of this distribution, and this is the standard deviation of that distribution. So then we could take this mean and take the standard deviation and construct a z value, and then plug that into a normal table, but I don't recommend this, because there is no basis for this, in fact. With the others, we get our mean and our variance based on the derivation under the formal, using the formal properties under the null. Here we just use the observations as they are and just crank them around to, to get this distribution. And just to summarize, Moran's value depends on the weights. They are not comparable across test statistics. Always keep in mind that different, weight, different weights will give you different results. We get the z-value by using these moments, and we standardize it. And important to remember, the mean is not zero. But for large data sets, and increasingly, that's what we use. It's irrelevant. For all practical purposes, it approaches zero. What does this mean? Luckily, it's kind of intuitive. Wait till you see the next one. Positive z-value and significant means rejecting the null in favor of an alternative of positive spatial autocorrelation. Negative z and significant means rejecting in favor of negative spatial autocorrelation. Be very careful. Always keep in mind the significance. Just the fact that you have a negative z as such doesn't mean you have negative spatial autocorrelation. Remember what we're doing is rejecting the null. If you can't reject a null, we have no spatial autocorrelation. Never mind the sign, it's irrelevant. We have nothing. It's only when you reject a null that you really should start looking at the sign. And then, as I mentioned last week, this doesn't tell you anything about whether it's high values or low values. It just tells you similar values locate in similar locations. I gave you an example of that last time. To close, this is something you might want to do for your assignment, is um, I haven't spent a lot of time on, the, on it this time, but I did last time around when we talked about the variogram and Krieging, this basic notion of stationarity. It means constant mean, constant variance. When you have proportions or rates, the variance is not constant. The variance depends on how many population at risk you have. Let me give you an example. If you're looking at leukemia rates, and you're looking at the number of leukemia cases over the number of children, that is an estimate of the underlying risk, if you wish, or probability that one has leukemia. Now, that estimate will have a better precision when you look at a larger pool than at a smaller pool. And the precision is related to how big your pool is. So this is called the small numbers problem. So if you have very sparsely populated areas, say with 200 peak kids, and one of these kids has leukemia, versus very densely populated, say 200,000 kids, and one of these kids has leukemia, is the probability the same or different? Well, you don't know. 
because your estimate of the probability, which is simply the ratio, cases over population at risk, has a huge variance when you only have 200 kids relative to 200,000 kids. So it could very well be that these probabilities that are underlying these cases are the same, but the estimated ratios will be very different. And so the reason um, for this is that the precision of your estimate when you don't have a large pool to base it on is much, much worse than when you have a large pool to base it on. What's important for us is that this precision, or it's reverse, the variance, is not constant, which violates our stationarity assumption. So to get stationarity, we need this constancy of the variance, and we don't have it. So then we could have a situation where by ignoring the fact that this variance changes, we're actually drawing incorrect inference or spurious inference. And to fix this, and I don't have time to get into the technicalities, we basically adjust the statistic. What we're doing is we standardizing the rates, we do some transformation to them, and then we compute Moran's I with these transform variables, and that takes care of the variance instability. So the, what I was suggesting earlier on as something you might want to do for your third assignment, if you're interested in, in rates, is just you need to have the count of the events and you need to have the population at risk. You, you compute the straight ratio, do a Moran's up. And then in Geoda, there is a special procedure to do the variance correction on the rates, and then you do Moran's eye that way, and you see if it's the same. One thing that might happen is that if you don't correct, you reject a null. If you do reject, you do correct, you don't. Uh, in my experience, I haven't found much difference between the two. There is a difference. There definitely is a numerical difference, but it seems like when you have very strong spatial order correlation in, in most of the cases I've seen, and that that's just you know a casual empiricism, it hasn't really made a big difference. I mean, you would think that on a theoretical basis it would make a much bigger difference than it in fact does. You know, the adjustments are fairly marginal, but it's something to keep in mind, uh, especially you know when a lot hangs on your results. This is one case where the the lack of stationarity may, may really affect your conclusion. Now we're moving on to the Moran scatter plot, which is actually a fairly simple way, straightforward way, to visualize Moran's eye. So far, we've just seen numbers and, and equations. So a Moran's eye of 0.5 is one single number characterizing the whole pattern. The idea for the Moran scatter plot was to somehow try to visualize it. So you could uh, see, first of all, how strong is the spatial autocorrelation, but also, more importantly, how does it organize itself in terms of correlation between high values, correlation between low values, and then also the opposites, the spatial outliers. That's really the motivation for this. The principle is very simple. If you done any regression analysis in matrix algebra, you'll see it right away. If you write a regression of the spatially lagged variable, WZ, on the original variable, then the slope is this. This is your x prime x inverse x prime y, but for one variable. So this expression is nothing but the slope of a line a line through points that consist of the value on the x-axis and the spatial lag on the y-axis. So we take the values, we plot them in a scatter plot, we fit the straight regression line through it, the slope of that line is Moran's up. That's just it. For example, you remember this from the first lecture, this is the um, non-wide population in census tracts in, in Milwaukee. On the horizontal axis, 
we, we rescale everything, we center them, and we standardize them. So a unit on each of these axes is one standard deviational unit. Okay. So on the horizontal axis, we have the percent uh, black in each census tract. And on the vertical axis, we have the average of the neighbors. Of course, this depends on what we define as neighbors, which is our W, our weights matrix. But that's just a number that we can compute. If we have the neighbors, we have the observations, we multiply them by the weights, that gives us a value. These give us points in the scatter plot. The line fit through that, the slope of that line is Marantha. And in this particular case, this is about as high as it gets in practice. You know, 0.88 is extremely high positive spatial order correlation. So far, no significance. There's no significance. We just have a number and, and a line that uh, visualizes the number. This is the other one that we saw in our very first lecture when we um, randomly reallocate people and then recompute recompute Marine's eye, and it just turns out this is a very nice example. It's as flat as can be. So the slope of the regression line through here is in effect zero, which means there is nothing here. To actually say something about inference, you have to again look at the randomization, and then you can draw things called randomization envelopes which show you the slopes that would fall the slopes that fall inside the randomization envelope correspond to non-significant Moran size. So when we do 999 of these there's a whole bunch of slopes that are not significant and they would be in this envelope and then when you come out of that then you would be significant. It's the same idea. It's always the same idea. Spatial randomness means you can put things wherever <coughs> with equal probability, and we can mimic that in our simulation. <coughs> More interestingly, this is a scatter plot, and we've centered everything on the mean. So we have four quadrants in the scatter plot. And these four quadrants, we can interpret them as four different types of spatial autocorrelation. And remember when I say high, it's high relative to the mean, because we've centered everything to the mean. So if you think about the upper right quadrant, these are values on the x-axis that are above the mean, and these are averages of the neighbors that are also above the mean. And I call that high, high. They are positively autocorrelated. They're both similar in terms of, they're not dissimilar, they're similar, and they're high in the sense of being above the mean. So these are potential clusters. So this is our connection to local spatial autocorrelation. Moran's eye is clustering. Looking at a quadrant looks at specific locations. These are specific locations where above average values are surrounded by neighbors that are also above average, on average. On average because they're weighted by the weights of the weights matrix. And then if you go to the matching quadrant of the lower left side, we get below mean values surrounded by below average neighbors. Still, this is positive spatial autocorrelation. It's still similarity, but it's similarity of low values. And I call that low, low. And they will suggest possible clusters, clusters local, of low values. And then the two other quadrants are negative spatial autocorrelation. The lower right hand side one is above average for the x axis below average for the neighbors. So this is high, low. A high value surrounded by low neighbor. We call that a spatial outlier. And then the upper left one is the other way around, is below average values 
surrounded by above average neighbors, low, high, again, spatial outliers. So by looking in an interactive fashion, the way we do it in Geoda, at the Moran scatter plot, you can start using linking and brushing to see where are these points that are in the upper quadrant, for example. And where are these outliers that are give us high values surrounded by low, low values surrounded by high? Purely exploratory. There's no significance here. The significance comes next lecture when we focus specifically on local spatial order correlation. So for example, here, this is the SITS data set uh, that we have in the samples um, out of Cressy's textbook, where we can highlight the points that are in the upper quadrant. These are points that where similar values tend to high, darker colors tend to be surrounded by darker colors. And the opposite is the high, low quadrant is where dark colors will tend to be surrounded by lighter colors. So high, low. And these we call spatial outliers. The, um, Moran scatter plot is a very useful thing, um, not just to visualize Moran's eye, but and to categorize the, the spatial correlation. But you can use it to do some sensitivity analysis, a, num a number of things. For example, you can find out are there any particular locations that drive the Moran's eye. I may have given you this example before. If you study conflict in Africa, we have this data set. And you use a weights matrix based on distance, for example. Then um, there's two countries that drive the Moran's eye that you get. And they're Egypt and Sudan, which are big countries, so their centroids are relatively far apart. They, they each have one neighbor, which is the other one. So Egypt, using that particular criterion, has Sudan as a neighbor, and Sudan has Egypt, Egypt as a neighbor. So in terms of Moran's eye averaging the neighbors, there's no averaging going on. There's one neighbor with the full weight. And in the Moran scatter plot, these points are way out. If you take them out, the slope changes. So that's, again, a way to assess whether, remember, we, we're really um, in a very carefully specified situation here where we have to think about stationarity and are the means constant, are the variances constant. So we constantly have to be on the lookout. Is there something going on with our data which violates these assumptions, which is actually not that hard to do because they're very strict assumptions. So one of the ways I like to use the Moran scatter plot is to get a sense of are there any locations or pairs of locations that really drive this distance. So that if you kick them out, there's statistic changes. If you look in one of the crime data sets, um, the St. Louis homicide crime data set, um, you can do a Moran scatter plot, take out the city of St. Louis, and see what happens to the slope. You know, these are the kinds of things that you use this for. Um, another one is sensitivity to boundary values. For example, by Clicking on the map, you can select all the polygons at the edge of the map. And then, as it's set up in Geoda, for example, the Moran's eye gets recalculated for the, the points that are not selected, so for the inner core. And you can see whether that slope changes or stays the same. Similarly, as you brush through the map, you can see whether these, this line corresponding to Moran's plot is stable or flips up and down. It shouldn't flip up and down. When it does, that is a suggestion of non-stationarity. For example, you could have part of the data set with very strong positive autocorrelation and other parts of the data set where there isn't. It's basically random. Well, if you brush the scatter plot or you brush the map linked to the scatter plot, you will see that. Because in part of your data set, you will have this nice positive slope, and then all of a sudden it starts falling down, which means spatial randomness. If you see that, that is one further indication that your nice assumption of stationarity 
has not been satisfied so that you know you're you're violating it and then you have to that doesn't mean you have to give up and go home it means you have to model the non-stationary and in the spatial regression analysis this is exactly what we do we model the non-constancy of the mean we've seen a little bit of that in the in the Krieging where we use a trend surface to model a mean that is not constant but then in regression we can model heteroscedasticity which is the non-constant variance and, and this is the residuals of that then we can analyze for spatial order correlation so these are a number of ways you can use the scatter plot we'll do this in the lab we'll spend time on that uh, on Thursday I just want to spend a few minutes telling you something about Geary C. Geary C is not in Geoda. It is in R, if you're interested in it. It is less used than Moran's I. And in part, I think this is because it measures something different. It doesn't measure similarity the way Moran's I does with a cross product, but it uses a square difference. So this measures dissimilarity. There's some advantages to this, as we saw with the semi-variogram, if you have square differences, you don't have to know what the mean is because the mean washes out. If you have a cross product, as in Moran's I, you do have to know what the mean is because you take, you center the variable, you, you have to compute the mean to do that. With Geary C, um, in the numerator, you don't have to, in the denominator, you do uh, because you, it's the same variance as before. Uh, it's an unbiased estimate, not the one we had before. Remember, Moran's I, we divide by n. Here we divide by n minus 1. The rest is very similar. We have our weights, wij. We have our square differences. We rescale this by twice the sum of the weights. But basically, this is another special case of our general cross-product statistic. Cross-product in the sense of combining a spatial weight element with a similarity measure <coughs> in, in that side. So um, how are we going about this? Same thing. Analytical derivation or computational. Computational, we already know how to do this. We'll shuffle it around. We'll recompute here to see we're in business. Analytical is a pain in the neck but luckily it's been done for somebody, by somebody before. We um, assume either normality, randomization, compute the mean, compute the variance, get the z-value, approximate that by a, a standard normal. So just to give you uh, a sense, I'll give you these equations in a minute. How do we interpret Geary C? Remember, it's this similarity. So it's the other way from what you think. The mean of Geary C is 1 under the null. Values less than 1 are positive autocorrelation. Larger than 1 are negative autocorrelation. Or after we standardize, negative z's are positive spatial autocorrelation. Positive z's are negative spatial autocorrelation. So it's the opposite from Moran's up. It's just something to remember. If you want to use this statistic, you know, in your project, of course, you're more than welcome to, but remember not to get confused by the interpretation because it's the exact opposite of Moran's I. So if you have a positive Z for Moran's I, you can expect a negative Z for Geary C. <coughs> this is the fun part. You, know, you do this derivation, the mean ends up to be one, the variance is this thing. Again, it doesn't depend on the variable, it only depends on the weights matrix. And then I won't dwell on this. Um, when we have randomization, it's more complicated. And where is it? Here's the B2, snakes in here in a number of different places. So this is a much more complicated thing to compute. It depends on the weights, weights through these three S's, these summaries of the weights matrix. And it depends on the data through the fourth and the second moment. That's really all I wanted to say.